What is the sweetest fruit in the wor world? Do you know what it is? Anybody. Sweetest fruit in the world. This was a little bit of a surprise to me. Now, the problem with saying whatever you might say is that there's a catch in that. Everybody doesn't taste everything the same. There is a difference in our taste buds and nobody can explain why you like what you like. Some people don't like, you know, cornbread in a glass of buttermilk. I don't know why. Some people want onions in with it. Some people don't want onions in with it. It just depends on what you like. Some people don't like crackling cornbread. Some people don't like, uh, you know, turnip greens or poke salad for that matter. Don't even know what it is. Some people don't know what's good. I'm sorry, I mean, I can't help that. You know, uh, some people have never killed a chicken with their bare hands. I can't fix everything. But what's the sweetest fruit in the world to you might be different from someone else. But by measure of sweetness, the sweetest fruit in the world are mangoes. And the, see what I mean? She's already said she doesn't like mangoes. So it doesn't matter what you like. The mango that's the sweetest of all is, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this, is C-A-R-A-B-A-O, Carabo, Carabe, mango. According to Guinness Book of World Records, it's the sweetness by, determined by the amount of sugar, if you will, in it, uh, but it's different for everybody. But the sugar content in a mango is 46 grams of sugar in an entire mango. A cup of sugar only has 23 grams. So a mango has the equivalent of two cups of sugar in it. Dates contain 73 grams of sugar. And yet they do not taste quite as sweet as strangely enough. Did you hear that? 73 grams of sugar and yet not quite as sweet. Bananas? have just over 20 grams of sugar. Figs have 19 grams of sugar. Persimmons, I always thought persimmons were kind of sour. Persimmons have 18.6 grams of sugar. But the sweetest of all the fruits are in the list like this, guavas, lychees, pomegranates, lemons, that's right, and grapes, sugar-wise. Now, what all that does is that's made me realize I'm changing my favorite fruit. Okay, now if guavas have 46 grams of sugar and I'm trying to keep myself slim and trim, my new, my new fruit is glazed donuts. They only have 12 grams, they only have 12 grams of sugar in them. So that's my new favorite fruit, glazed donuts. If you want to get me some fruit, I'm going to get me a glazed donuts for 12 grams of Sugar, that's half of a, of a mango or less. There are those among churches who are not filled with the Spirit. Now, I, you can't tell that by looking at folks, but apparently it is true. In Jude chapter 1, verses 16 through 19, don't turn to chapter 2, but in chapter 1, verses 16 through 19, it says this, These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there were, would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons. The word sensual person there literally means merely natural people who cause divisions. And this is the most interesting statement here in verse 19 of Jude, not having the spirit. Now these are people among us. This was not talking about people of the world. This was talking about people in the kingdom and the Holy Spirit describes them as people not having the spirit. Mm. So, they not only do not have the Spirit, they may be those that say they do not have the Spirit. 
Uh, I don't know. What's more, they, they apparently don't think they need the Spirit or they would probably have the Spirit. They must not want the Spirit. They're not sweet. In this text, it's clear they're not sweet. Uh, they're the tough people. They're the grumbling, the complaining, the self-motivated, the seeking their own advantage, trusting only the natural, and being slightly divisive. That's how he described them. Those are not my words. That's the description of a person who doesn't have the Spirit. Uh, Doris Akers wrote in 1962. 1962, that's hard to believe. This was written in 1962. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face. And I know that it's the presence of the Lord. And then it goes, sweet Holy Spirit, sweet Heavenly Dove. You know that song. I know you've heard it. But notice the connection, and it wasn't my original connection, but notice the connection with long-term thinking is there's a sweetness connected to the Holy Spirit and a bitterness and an emptiness and a meanness connected to not having the Spirit. That's significant to me, is it not? It appears to be the case. A couple of things to note. How do we obtain the Spirit and the blessings of the sweetness of its fruit? Well, there's a lot said in the Scriptures about this. Some people want you to believe that we don't even get the Spirit today. That's very few, by the way. Most people do not think like that. It's usually people who think they're real smart. But uh, if you just begin to look, there are many indications in Scriptures that we can have the Spirit and there seems to be many avenues from being immersed into Christ uh, by believing. Galatians chapter 3 makes a huge argument for that. Uh, then there's just reading the scriptures according to Ephesians 3, Ephesians 6. There's a discussion of just desiring the Spirit. Romans 8, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5. Praying for the Spirit. I mean, that may be something you might be surprised, but it's encouraged in the scriptures. Jesus himself said that we are to ask for the Spirit. Luke eleven thirteen, 13. By allowing the Spirit to have its way, letting the Spirit lead. That's the terminology that's used in the scriptures that I've got up there. By receiving the Spirit, so the Spirit can be offered and you don't receive it, so we're told to receive the Spirit. In fact, Jesus encourages His apostles at one point to receive the Spirit. By changing, our lives changing, is one of the ways the Spirit comes to rest upon us according to the scriptures. Uh, by rejoicing, literally in rejoicing, the Spirit, it, because the Spirit and joy are connected together, that just by rejoicing is an indication and a way of receiving the Spirit of God into us. By blessing and others also, and by being blessed, the Spirit comes upon us. Those are the things that the Scriptures say. I mean, you can look it up, you can disagree, you might not like all of those things, but they are true. We have the Spirit according to the Scriptures. And whether you feel like you have the Spirit or not, the Scriptures say we have the Holy Spirit. And I want to look at three ways that we know that the fruit of that Spirit is the sweetness of the Christian. Okay? Three simple lessons. Number one, the fruit of the Spirit is the sweetness for it is positive and incontestable. You cannot even find fault with this idea. This was read just a moment ago uh, when Heath read. Doesn't he do a good job? I'm not partial. He's my firstborn. What do you want me to say? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Notice this statement. Against such, there's no law. Somebody wants to find fault with this, they've got no basis. There's no basis at all. It is incontestable. Not only are these positive attitudes, not only are they wonderful and good attitudes to have, who can find fault with them is the point he makes. But more than that, they're positive. Love is a positive emotion, amen? amen. 
Uh, can you not say that joy is a positive emotion? You, who doesn't want to be full of joy? Peace. Peace is positive. Long suffering. Sitting in traffic and not losing your cool. Kindness, goodness, long suffering, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Those. Can anyone name a negative? thing at all. Think about it just a minute. One negative thing about these qualities of the fruit of the Spirit. Not one. Nothing. Can anyone suggest one sinful or one weakness of character found in that fruit? No. So we have the Spirit and we know the fruit of the Spirit is the sweetness because if you have the Spirit you're full of of a positive attitude and it's the most incontestable quality a person can have. Nobody can find fault with a positive attitude. Okay? Simple lesson. Number two. The fruit of the Spirit is the sweetness for it is proven and acceptable. In Ephesians chapter 5, look at verses 9 and 10. You might turn there. Ephesians 5, verses 9 and 10. Verse 9 says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. That's as straightforward as you can get. Can anyone name better proof that you have the Holy Spirit? Somebody says, well, I know a lot of Bible." That's not proof. The devil can quote scripture. Well, he knows a lot. That doesn't mean anything necessarily. A person can be very intelligent. Can anyone name better proof of the Spirit than what is named in this passage? Goodness. He's a good man. Righteousness. He is a righteous man. Truthfulness. She is a truthful woman. Those qualities are proven and they are proof of the presence of the Spirit of God. Can anyone suggest the Spirit would move on anyone and encourage you to do something that is not acceptable before God? Somebody says, well, now you don't believe the Holy Spirit works directly on you. Of course I do. Of course I do. Well, what do you believe it does? Only things that would be in absolute harmony with the Word of God. Amen. Why would it do different? Somebody says, well, then it's just the Word. No, the Spirit is not the Word. The Word is the sword of the Spirit. That's not true. But when the Holy Spirit works upon our heart, either through the Word or some other means directly upon us, then what do you have? You have a person who lives a good life a righteous life, and a truthful life. That's what you have. That's what you should expect. And it's proof that you have the Spirit, and it's acceptable. We have the Spirit, and we know we have the fruit of the Spirit because there should be a sweetness about us. What should be that sweetness? That should be a good person, a righteous person, and a person that tells the truth. That's the proven and acceptable behavior of someone with the fruit, that sweet fruit of the Holy Spirit and what you should look for within yourself or anyone else. Number three, the fruit of the Spirit is the sweetness for it is prudent and peaceable. In two passages here, Hebrews 12 and verse 11 says, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. I noticed that when I was a kid. I don't remember ever being thrilled that my mama or my daddy spanked me. Did y'all remember that? I don't remember thinking, boy, I'm so glad they did that. Not at that moment, but I, I have noticed that when I spanked my kids, for about a week they act like they were happy. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all don't know what I'm talking about, do you? My kids were happy for about a week after they got a spank. Y'all remember that? Y'all looking at me funny. My kids, now they don't remember that. 
Well, Deb and I remember it. They acted happier for the next week after they got a good swatting on their rear end. I don't know if you can do that anymore. You probably can't even talk about that. It's probably illegal to discuss it. But it says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. At least I hope it's painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable, listen to these words, the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained or exercised by it. You should expect that when God goes to work on you, when He chastens you, when He is, God moves from heaven to do something in your life, it is going to hurt. You're not going to like it. You're not going to enjoy it. It's going to be unpleasant, whatever it is. But what it yields within you is a fruit. Not just a fruit of righteousness, but it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness. It brings peace to your soul. Just like what I was talking about with the kids. When you spank a kid, you will notice that child. Now I'm not talking about right then because they're going to be crying for a little while. I get that. But you will notice a peace that will rest on that child. Same thing happens to you, ladies and gentlemen. When God deals with you and then you come out of it, there's a peace that rests on you. There's a peace that rests on you. And James puts it this way. James 7, verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom, so now we're talking about wisdom. But the wisdom that is from above that we're to pray for, he mentions in James chapter 1, we're to pray for it. Well, now he explains where it comes from and it comes from God. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then listen to this word, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness, this is the fruit, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now he says this comes down from above. You get this direct. In fact, that's what you pray for in James chapter 1. So you pray for wisdom and this wisdom brings a peaceableness in your nature that you can get along with people better than you can without this wisdom that God gives you. People who can't get along hadn't been praying much for wisdom and God hadn't been giving them a lot of wisdom. Because if you've been given some wisdom, you learn how to get along with folks, amen? amen. And you know what that means, right? That means get along with folks that are difficult. If you think it means get along with folks that aren't difficult, then you don't understand the concept. Anybody can get along with Santa Claus, but getting along with somebody that's difficult, that's different, right? That somebody's not wanting to do something for you. So it's about peaceable nature. Can anyone name greater wisdom of the Spirit than peace and unity among brethren? You want, it, you want an indication of the Holy Spirit? A church that doesn't split. A church that ain't quibbling all the time. You see a church that can't get along. You see a church that splits. You see people saying, well, I ain't going to have that. Let me tell you something I know about them. That ain't one led by the Holy Spirit. No. Because if you're led by the Holy Spirit, if God's Spirit's really working upon you, you find a way to get along with everybody. Amen. You say, well, oh, it's doctrinal. Let me tell you something, what I've discovered about splits and doctrine. It only becomes doctrinal when it becomes personal. When you get personally offended, you try to figure out something doctrinal wrong with that person. So when you hear somebody say, well, I think something doctrinally wrong. Let me tell you something, what I know. They got a personal offense going on and they're looking for a reason, some kind of wedge to drive in. Do you need to, whenever anybody tells you, I'm not sure if he's standing for the truth, you need to pay attention to that individual because that individual's got a problem. That problem does, because if they were, didn't have a problem, they'd work it out. Now, I'm not saying there's never any false doctrine taught, but I want to tell you something, that's so few and far between that's caused a church split that it'd be hard to find a dog that has less hair on it than that one. I'm telling you, it's just no such thing. It just doesn't exist. People cause trouble because they are trouble causers. I know that's not friendly, but it's true. So peace and unity is a sign that God has given you wisdom, prudence, 
to know that you need to be peaceable. God has worked upon your heart. Can anyone suggest that the Spirit would dare motivate our hearts or our words or our actions to, 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 to literally motivate us to reflect some kind of divisive spirit or some kind of bitter spirit or some kind of envious spirit or some kind of proud boasting spirit or some kind of self-seeking spirit? Can you imagine the Holy Spirit leading anybody to doing that? There is not possible. God has never indwelt somebody to encourage those attitudes. Ever. Not once. Not ever. It has never happened. If that's a part of somebody you know, then know this. The Spirit is not moving in their life. The devil's moving in their life. That's from the devil. That is not from God. We have the Spirit and we know the fruit of the Spirit is the sweetness because it produces a prudent peaceableness, a very wise peaceableness. Get along. You know how you know what you see when, when there is a church split going? What you'll find, and God forbid we ever have such a thing, but what you'll find, if you're ever a part of a church like that, what you'll find is the one stirring, good brethren will step away. Don't want to be a part of that. They want to come over and talk to you. Don't want to talk about that. Don't even want to hear it. You got a problem with the brother? Go talk to him. Amen? Amen? That's the way you deal with that. So the fruit is the sweetness. And we should be the sweetest people on earth. Amen? Amen. Shouldn't we be? So, and if we are, then there ought to be a positiveness that's incontestable. There is no rule against it. There is no law against the Spirit moving us to be positive. It, we ought to be proven that we are doing those things that are acceptable. We are good, we are righteous, we're truthful. There ought to be a prudence about us, a peaceable prudence finding a way to be at peace with everybody. Let's note, though, that there is a danger and there's a blessing of the sweetness of the fruit of the Spirit. The danger, here's the danger, in not noticing a bitter or negative shift in a church. You got to pay attention to that. I've been in many a church that's gone negative, and it could have been prevented. You got to pay attention. You got to pay attention and, and not stop communicating. I heard of a park ranger at Yellowstone. It was leading a group of uh, hikers to a fire lookout, and the ranger was so intent on telling his little group that were hiking along with him about the flowers and the plants and the trees and the animals and he's talking just about everything, just talking about everything. Then he considered the messages that were coming in on his radio because he's a ranger, he's got a radio, and these messages, you know, beep, and then it says, you know how it is. And he got tired of that happening, so he reached down and he switched it off. And they continued and he kept talking about all the flowers and the animals and they neared the tower. When they got near the actual look at tower, suddenly a man ran from the tower to meet him and he was running as fast as he could. And when he got there, he's <gasps> breathing like crazy. He's about to pass out. And he says, why, why weren't you listening to your radio? And he said, well, we were. And he said, why? What does it matter? <laughs> and he says, well, We've been watching from above. A grizzly's been stalking the whole group. And we were trying to warn you of the danger. So the message was weren't getting through because they chose to ignore them. So if you start seeing a negative, bitter attitude, don't ignore it. That's a serious problem. And there's blessing in feeling and knowing by the sweetness that God is with you. You say, well, I, I, only if I saw some great, grand, wonderful miracle happen, then I know God's with me. No, it doesn't take that. But there are indications that when God's with you and when he's not. I uh, heard of a little boy who was flying a kite. Y'all remember flying a kite? Nobody flies kites anymore. I guess too many power lines. You know, the boys that are flying kites aren't around anymore. I don't know. There's a lot of power lines around. But used to, we used to fly kites. You remember that? And this little boy got it, had a really good kite, and he, it was a windy day, and he had a lot of string, and he let it out and let it out 
and let it out until it got up high enough you couldn't see the kite. Have you ever done that? Got it high enough that you could not see the kite. Well, they couldn't see the kite. And a man walked along and he's sitting there holding the string. And a man walks up to him and looks up. He didn't see anything. And so he looks at the boy and says, how do you know you even have a kite up there? And the little boy said, because I can feel it. If you got the spirit, you can feel it. There is a sweetness. Amen? Not a bitterness. Not trouble. Not fractious. There's a sweetness. Avoid all bitterness. All wrath. All malice. All evil speaking. Avoid it. It's not the Spirit of God leading us to that. Salvation in the Spirit is a wonderfully sweet thing. To be saved is sweet. Amen. To know Jesus is sweet. And to be changed, you become a sweeter person. That's what you should expect. And so I say to you, taste and see. The Lord is sweet. Amen? Amen. If you would hear the gospel, if you would just hear it and you would choose to believe it, and you would repent of your sins, confess the name of Christ, be baptized this very night. Not only will you be forgiven, but you would taste the sweetest life on earth and God's Spirit would come into you. That's the invitation if you'll have it, if you'll come. Come now while we stand and while we sing.